links to the close study films. So if you're out, if you haven't already got copies of the films, you haven't dragged them over from the student shared area, and you won't really have to do it from home. The best way to do it is to go onto the college website. So if you go onto um, the web browser, go onto the college website, rygate.ac.uk, click on the portal, and you've got this remote file access. It'll ask you to log in. Once you've logged in, you basically just click on uh, student shared area. And if you scroll down to film studies, you will see films on there. And A2 exam films are all listed. So the ones we've obviously focused on are Catfish, The Imposter, uh, Documentary, got City of God, La Hent, World Cinema and Fire Club, so you can download those. Obviously, um, the speed of the download will depend upon your broadband connection. They are quite large files, um, which is probably why it's easier to do it in college, if possible, and just copy them onto a memory stick. But anyway, if you don't do that, um, the films are on there. Okay. So with eStream, obviously, there's chapters for some of the films as well, which will be useful, but obviously, eStream hasn't always been as reliable as we'd like over the last few months, so actually having copies of the film is probably beneficial. So once you've done that, obviously the main focus for your revision should be your own notes, but also resources on Moodle. So if you log into Moodle, again, if you're outside of college, you can do this through the portal. And you'll see here, I mean, it's laid out in a pretty straightforward way. You should be familiar with this already. Um, you don't have to worry about FM3, A and B, that's the course that that's completed. So you've got the three different sections here, A, B and C. There's the Easter Revision Planner, which you should have looked at already, which um, obviously was revision you should have over the, the Easter holiday in advance of the revision you're doing now. Um, but anyway, if you go on to FM4A, if you look on here, the, the, the format is pretty much the same for each page. You've got an introduction which kind of puts each part of the exam into context. This tells you here what you need to demonstrate for each part of the course, what films you need to watch, and there are links to the films on eStream, um, stretch and challenge, and then also below here you've got past papers, you've got an A grade response, or a couple of A grade responses, and also the WJC mark scheme. So essentially this should be a sort of framework for your revision. Uh, focusing on one aspects of each topic you're not familiar with. So the key the key focus really first of all is in this part. You need to make sure that you feel confident that you can do each of these things in the exam. Okay, so for example, think about how world cinema may differ from mainstream Hollywood films as a starting point for looking at um, world cinema. The ability to discuss how urban environments are represented through both micro film form and macro narrative features. Now, this is important because in the exam, there's an emphasis on one of these in terms of the choice of questions. So you might get a question which will focus on style, technique, film form. It might specifically say sound, mise-en-scene, camera work, editing. In that case, you need to be very familiar with um, film form, film language, which is stuff we did in, in the, the, the first year. Um, if you click on here, you'll see this provides an overview of all the key sort of terminology. So anything you're not sure about in terms of cinematography, for example, um, you know, looking at things like angle, camera positioning, all the information you need is on there. Okay, so that's quite a good revision resource to use. Okay, uh, macro features is basically looking at narrative. The idea of narrative is, you know, there's two elements to narrative essentially, what we call the plot and the story. In terms of doing a narrative analysis, looking at sort of the, the film's themes, for example, you're looking at what's called the explicitly presented information, which is the plot, so what happens, but also what information can be inferred from those key events. So you don't want your answer to be too descriptive, just explaining what happens in La Hain or what happens in City of God. You want to ensure you're actually discussing the significance of those key events. Okay, so some useful material there. There are a range of more specific resources here on both of the close study films. So you've got a, a range of resources on La Hen, for example, um, reading presentation questions we looked at in class, some extension work, looking at social and political context, other bits and pieces we, which you'll find useful, all, all of which we looked at in class. And there's a similar thing, obviously, for, for City of God as well. Okay, so do use those resources. And a really good resource in terms of your exam preparation is this one, which I emailed to you the other day, 
um, which is essentially a, a, a comparison between City of God and Lahem, which is really, really good and really, really sort of focused in terms of the sort of things that you need to discuss in the exam. So do have a look through that as well as part of your exam preparation. Okay, so that's section A. Um, if we go back now to um, skip the way and section B, documentary. Again, the format's pretty similar. You've got an introduction here which explains the context of what we're doing. You've got what, what you need to demonstrate, the films, stretch and challenge, and again at the bottom, past papers and you know all the usual stuff. Um, so if you look at the introduction first, the, the focus on section B is on spectatorship. Okay, so the idea is we're looking at how the spectator responds to film. So looking at that as an abstract concept rather than personal response, which is the focus for AS. So understanding of preferred, negotiated, oppositional readings is important. And also understanding about document documentary as a form of filmmaking. So an understanding of how the spectator can be positioned by media text. This is the sort of encoding, decoding stuff that we looked at in class. And again, you know, you don't necessarily have to use this terminology directly in the exam, although it might be useful in terms of the question, but certainly it's the, the, the principle of different types of reading depending on the context of reception. So the dominant reading, the preferred reading, which is how we're, we're positioned to respond to the text. Obviously, think about trying for the will. We are positioned by that text to accept the ideology of Hitler and the Nazi party and to think that Hitler is a great leader. Now, because we are watching it in a different context, we're more likely to have this reading. We're, you know... 70 years later, we know what happened in the Second World War, the Holocaust, the connotations of Hitler means we're going to have this kind of reading. Okay, So an understanding of different possible readings dependent on context and how we are positioned by a text are really essential to this part of the course. Okay, So that's the first thing to be sure you, you're com comfortable with. Also looking at... you know. A sort of sophisticated understanding about how we can be positioned by a text using principally film forms. So thinking about how we can be manipulated. Another question is obviously focused on that question of manipulation, the extent to which we are manipulated by a text through representation of real events. And there was this video here from Charlie Brooker. CGI. Sort of a humorous look at um, reality TV and the fact that, you know, in looking at reality TV, often there are quite specific techniques used to try and appeal to a particular audience and create characters as well through the process of editing, for example. Um, forms and conventions of documentary, you need to be familiar with that as well. So the different modes, the emphasis on verbal language, overheard exchange, testimony, exposition, where, where they're used in documentaries and, and why and how, and for what particular effect. So, for example, in the imposter, there's an awful lot of what we call testimony, which is sort of witness statements, um, people talking about how they were affected by the events that, that happened and how they responded to them, etc. Overheard ex exchange, the idea we're apparently listening in on conversation, spontaneous dialogue between two or more participants, and exposition, where we're directly addressed through the text. So that's all useful as well. Back. Um, and this bit here, the ability to discuss the similarities and differences between fictional and non fictional filmmaking, really the, the focus there is looking at the development of documentary. The early documentaries were very distinct from narrative films, uh, and certainly during the development of documentary filmmaking through the 50s, 60s, even up to the 70s and 80s, documentary is much more of a sort of marginalised form of filmmaking. Today, though, documentary is much more mainstream and has much broader, much broader appeal. And one of the reasons for that, you could argue, is the fact that um, documentary filmmakers are using techniques from fiction filmmaking. So whether it be, for example, in um, The Imposter, the use of heavy reconstruction, stylized reconstructions, um, the use of low-key lighting, the use of continuity editing, uh, the use of non diegetic music to sort of position the audience in terms of a certain response and to make the film quite engaging. Uh, Catfish as well uses, uses a sort of a, you know a, a kind of conventional narrative structure, although it's a, you know ostensibly an observational documentary. It uses a very strict kind of narrative structure in terms of its development, where it sets up the stories, the complications that occur, the kind of enigma about you know who is 
who are these people who are contacting Neve, and then obviously you've got the closing act where it always reveals. So it keeps us gripped through the structure of the text, which is obviously something that wasn't perhaps the case with earlier documentaries, particularly the sort of direct cinema movement, where it was literally events speaking for themselves. There was no real sense of structure. Um, the advantage of that approach to documentary, obviously, is that it does feel perhaps more real. There's less in intervention from the filmmaker. But a downside is that the films were perhaps less engaging and therefore, from an audience's point of view, quite frustrating. Until you give me shelter where you see someone being stabbed on film, but there's no sense of context. There's no real sense of why it happened, who were the people involved and what happened afterwards. Uh, and you could argue that perhaps the role of a documentary filmmaker is to try and, you know, help the audience out a little bit, providing some sort of context. Yes, you're intervening. Yes, you're, you're, you're kind of representing reality in a certain way, but at least you're making a more engaging film. So those are sort of things you might be asked to consider for the, the documentary topic. Um, so you've got resources here. I mean, this goes through, as I said, the, the different modes of documentary as well. You've got poetic, expository, observational, participatory or interactive, reflexive and performative. Um, now, the key thing about these different modes is it's not one mode per film. So obviously in some films a particular mode might dominate. So in Gimme Shelter it's very much an observational documentary. Um, you know, if you're looking at The Imposter, there's a lot of use of this mode, the kind of reconstruction of reality. Um, but you know, if you're looking at, at both films, they combine a range of modes. I mean, you could argue that the imposter uses sort of poetic devices. There's lots of exposition through testimony. And also some observational footage. The, the footage of the Nicholas Barclay before he disappeared. And also the, the quite sort of chilling scene, I suppose, where Frederick, the real Frederick, we see him arrive at the airport posing as Nicholas. So a documentary, these, particularly these days, will often use a range of modes in order to try and engage the audience. And don't forget the importance of this, the idea of representation as a concept, that even if it's a documentary, it is still a representation. It's not the same as reality. What goes on here is important, Okay, the, what we call mediation, the process of making the film. And obviously you could argue that some films are more mediated than others. In other words, the filmmaker is doing more in terms of what Grierson called the creative treatment of reality. If, you know, The filmmaker is actually you know, through the editing process, through um, the way the film is structured, the way in which interviews are conducted or decisions are made about who to interview, that can influence the representation. Um, and this process of mediation often causes controversy in documentary filmmakers, obviously in Catfish, the extent to which, well, what's gone on here? To what extent have the filmmakers actually, you know, perhaps manipulated the events or reconstructed events or even faked events to try and create an interesting film. Um, and that's obviously something that could be explored in the context of Catfish. You know, how real is the film? You know, how much do we trust it? But don't, you know, don't go too far and perhaps assume that everything is fake. Because I think, you know, there are, there are real events there, but there are question marks about how the sort of narrative, if you like, develops. You know, how much does Neve actually know? During the course of the film, how much is he, you know, how much is he perhaps perhaps playing along with the whole scenario to make an interesting film? Okay, so that's documentary. Now, the final part is Fight Club. Obviously, as you know, with Fight Club, um, section C of the paper, it's what's called a critical close study. There are thirty marks available for this question, as opposed to thirty-five for A and B. Um, and the idea is, you're looking at a particular film and focusing on it in a sort of synoptic way. The idea is you're bringing in different aspects of the course in terms of one film. So looking from an institutional perspective, looking in terms of its representations, looking in terms of narrative, film form, and also using perhaps critical theory as well uh, and to evaluate how effective that critical theory is in terms of discussing the film. So section C is probably the most challenging section theoretically, largely because it is kind of introducing you to the sort of concepts you might do if you're doing a degree in film. Um, however, because of the film Fight Club is quite accessible, it's quite interesting, it's quite thought-provoking, uh, students tend to do quite well as part of the paper, and certainly that has been reflected in the mocks that I've seen so far this year. Okay, so what you need to know, production and distribution of the film, some of the problems there, useful background, because the problem with Fight Club was it was 
conceived by the studio, 20th Century Fox, as a big budget, kind of high concept, star driven vehicle with Brad Pitt and Ed Norton and, you know, lots of fight scenes. And, and, and David Fincher directed a very different view of the film. He saw it more as a sort of art film, a big budget art film. And that created, created a huge problem in terms of budgeting, casting, marketing. All those things were kind of very sort of divisive in terms of the. the film's kind of protracted journey from from sort of conception to, to screen with David Finch having a, a particular view about how the film should be marketed using very kind of subversive kind of posters um, you know like like the one you've probably seen in the classroom which says you're not special um, quite enigmatic images of just bars of soap which you know obviously the studio are thinking well, what's this saying to an audience how well, you know sends out very sort of you know confused messages about the films how we how people are going to go and see the film based on this very sort of obscure marketing material um i suppose you could argue that fincher was kind of a one of the first people to kind of grasp the idea of viral marketing you deliberately create something that isn't sort of mysterious and strange and, and unusual to try and capture people's attention but anyway the, the studio had a very different view of the film they were advertising it you know during WWF bouts and things like that, which really upset David Finchie because it thought it sent out a wrong message about the film. Now, that the effect of this was was probably this. The, the film was controversial in its release. There were lots of concerns regarding its depiction of violence, accusations the film was misogynist, accusations that the film was actually glorifying in sort of fascist ideology, uh, when you could argue the film was obviously representing these things, but not in an uncritical fashion. Um, so an understanding of what the film's doing in terms of representations and the controversies surrounding it are really, really important. There are some specific resources here. The stretch and challenge stuff, you're going to use critical theory. I'll come back to that in a moment. But the overview on Fight Club is probably the way that the sort of starting point for, for your revision. Um, let's wait for that to open. Um, because this will give you a sense of what it is we've covered and obviously what you need to discuss in the exam. So the four key areas, production context, narrative film, themes, critical reception, critical frameworks. Obviously, there's going to be specific questions on these two. So question 17 is the critical framework question, which is perhaps the more challenging one, which might be best to be avoided if you're not that confident. Critical reception relates to how the film was received by critics at the time and how it's been sort of re-evaluated since and some of the controversies surrounding the film in terms of violence, um, representations of gender and political ideology. The sort of narrative film themes, what the film's about, that will you know relate to potentially question twenty six, as will perhaps the production context stuff, sort of institutional context around the film. Okay, so don't forget you've got a choice of three questions for section C. So um, this is just obviously stuff we looked at in class. You should have notes on this already. Um, there's some notes here on the film's representation and in terms of its key themes. Again, these questions you should have done in class. Uh, you focus on a particular area individually and then wrote up your notes on that, so look through those. And then for question 18, this is crucial, the different reviews of the film. Now, to answer question 18 well, you need to show some awareness of how the film was received by different critics. So Alexander Walker's review was obviously the most negative, quite vitriolic in terms of like accusing the film of essentially being a kind of you know, a kind of uh, propaganda, Nazi propaganda in the way in which, you know, Triumph of the Will was. Very hysterical sort of tone to that review. And, and you know, even at the time, people were kind of like, um, felt that was a bit extreme. Uh, Roger Ebert's probably more typical of how the film was reviewed in the, in the sense that he liked parts of it, particularly the anti-consumerist stuff, the first part of the film, but felt the film lost its way in the second half, the whole Project Mayhem stuff the feeling that the film was too indulgent of kind of fascist ideas and wasn't critical enough of them. Whereas Janet Maslin's review, another contemporary review when the film came out, is much more positive and argues that no, the film isn't actually vindicating these ideas, it's critical of them. And it's perhaps simplistic to assume, as both Ebert and Walker do, that audiences would misunderstand the film somehow and the film could be dangerous. So, interesting perspective, and obviously trying to relate your own response to the film in the context of how the film was reviewed at the time. And obviously now that the film has been, you know, around for 15 years nearly, the film has been reevaluated somewhat. It often appears in sort of top tens, greatest films of, of you know, the last 20 years or even the greatest, greatest films of all time. So it's, it, it did very well on DVD and critically now it seemed to be a, something of a classic, whereas at the time it was very, very divisive. And you could argue that's probably because of the context it's released when it was just after Columbine, People are perhaps, you know, on the first viewing, 
didn't perhaps appreciate what the film was trying to do. If you watch the film a second and third time, the film does perhaps start to reveal itself more, and you know you can perhaps see what David Fincher was trying to get across. Uh, and that was certainly my experience of watching the film on the first when I first saw it in the cinema. I didn't like it at all, but watching it again, I think the film does certainly improve repeated viewings and it is one of those films that people do watch again and again and again um, so the Columbine stuff is relevant particularly in terms of looking at why the film was controversial in terms of its depiction of violence you know looking at what's happened recently with the uh, shootings in America Django Unchained was for example pulled from its release in the aftermath of, of shooting in America you had the situation with Dark Knight Rises as well the lone gunman went into a cinema so these things do affect films on their release and, and people can be a bit more sensitive about violence um, in the aftermath of sort of you know real life sort of horrific events. The critical framework stuff obviously you had a one-to-one -one with either me or Rosie about this. The idea is trying to link it in with your research project. So taking a critical approach, uh, whether it be genre, auteur, gender, social, political, and relating that to your study of Fight Club, how useful that approach has been. Um, so it's a more challenging question, but depending on what you did for your research project and depending on how confident you are in terms of bringing in critical frameworks, it is a question that's worth considering doing. And obviously, you've, you've had some advice from um, either myself or Rosie on that. Just going back to Moodle, there is, under the Stretch and Challenge section, a, a link to critical theory resources. So depending on what you're doing, we've got stuff on auteur, feminism, for gender... Uh, genre, institutional stuff, psychoanalysis, stuff on the male gaze, okay, so there's information out there, uh, and obviously if you want any further advice on that for question 17, then, you know, probably best to drop me an email before the exam, okay, so that's the kind of overview really what you should be doing for your revision, just finally looking at the exam paper, obviously you've all done a mock, or most of you have done a mock, if you still want to do a full mock, if you didn't do it, or you want to do any more past papers and just Either drop them in at the college team and I'll mark them or email me if you want. Just to remind you, it's two and three quarter hours. Ignore that date, it's last year, it's the 20th of June this year. Still a late exam. A and B, 35 marks. Section C, 30 marks. You go straight to questions five and six. So with five or six, there'll be a different emphasis normally. In this case, question five was a sort of more, what we call a macro question, more focused on themes and context. Question six is start the sort of style film form question. Now it won't always be that way around. You'll remember from the mock you did that question five with the focus was more on the sort of film form. The key thing is to read the question and, and make sure you understand what the question is asking you, rather than oh question five is going to be this question, question six is going to be that question. The distinction between film form, micro, macro is not you know they're not mutually exclusive there's a lot of crossover between the two so you're going to be talking about similar things but obviously the key thing is if it is a question of style technique film form you will have to make reference to specific techniques that are used in terms of camera editing sound means on send depending on whatever comes up and it's question 11 and 12 for documentary documentary tends to be perhaps the most difficult section just in terms of the question and how they're, they're written um, sometimes it catches people out but obviously there are certain themes that emerge with, with, with section B themes might be for example this for creative treatment of actuality the idea that documentaries are manipulated or you know documentary filmmakers are creatively looking at reality and, and offering a particular representation of it I mean what are some of the issues of that in terms of representation of the real another question here directly looking at manipulation other questions you might get you know is there a particular type of documentary that, that is more real than another uh, is point of view important in documentary you know in terms of how we understand reality so these are the sort of things that will, that will come up um, th there's much more emphasis on, on in documentary for you actually adopting a position in relation to the question and having a sort of clear and coherent argument so it's really important you do plan carefully for for section b and obviously the imposter catfish they're the two focus films but Often it's a good idea to perhaps bring in Try It For The Will and or Gimme Shelter for some kind of context, um, particularly if you have a question that's looking at different types of documentary because both Catfish and Imposter use a range of different techniques, whereas Gimme Shelter and Try It For The Will are, are kind of polar opposites in terms of their approach to documentary. Try It For The Will is very subjective, very manipulative, kind of a propaganda film, 
whereas in the attempt with Gimme Shelter to try and be as objective as possible, although you could still argue that is an issue in the film. So look for the notes on those as well. And then with section C, it's 17, 18 or 26. So 17, this was a tricky one last year because they actually mentioned auteur as a particular focus, although it does say how far has an awareness of the filmmaker as auteur influenced your response to your chosen film. So you could just basically say, well, it's useful, but actually I found a gendered approach more relevant or a social political approach or you know whatever it, it relates to your sort of um, research project. Question 18 is probably the most straightforward in terms of how it's worded. It's basically looking at your response to the film, often, in the context of how it's reviewed by critics uh, or how it was received generally in terms of its, its, its critical reception and some of the controversies arranged by that. So just a discussion of violence, gender and political ideology would be useful and then looking at the different perspective that, that Alexander Walker, Janet Maslin and, and Roger Ebert had on that, how it relates to your own opinion of the film. So that's quite a good one. And then 26 is obviously the, the wild card one. Always look at 26 because it might be one you think, yeah, I could, I could really do a good answer for that one. I, you know, I like the way that's worded. So do look at this question 26. As I said, because it specifically mentions Fight Club, it's going to be more specific to Fight Club, where the other two questions could be applied to any of these films. Um, but yeah, so you know, looking at this idea of Fight Club as a complex film, it'll often relate to some aspect of the film in terms of its themes, or in terms of its representations, or perhaps in terms of institutional context. So the question one one year, which looked at you know why is Fight Club a cult film, and the idea of a cult film, a very strong, loyal, dedicated, almost obsessive following. What is it about Fight Club that has created that effect? So look through the past papers. You've got access to those through Moodle. Um, and just you could have a go at answering a few questions or just planning them out, thinking about how you'd approach them. And as I said, if you've got any past papers that you, you have a go at and you want me to mark them, then I'll be quite happy to do that for you. Okay, so good luck for the exam. Don't forget the impact sessions. They're, they're the same session runs twice. The first session is the 18th of June, 10 to 12 o'clock. It'll be in P6, which is downstairs in Performing Arts, and that session will be repeated on the 19th of June, uh, in the afternoon, 2 to 4 o'clock, again in P6. So hopefully I'll see you there. Okay, thank you.